Hello, everybody. Hey, this is going to be our uh, lecture on um, gravitation. Um, so universal gravitation is um, going to be essentially our last chapter uh, that we're going to uh, go through. Now, um, we want to think about all of the forces, all the fundamental forces that there are in the universe uh, that we know of. And those are uh, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, uh, and the weak nuclear force. Now, gravity, if you were to ask 90% of the people uh, in, uh, in the world, and you would ask them, what is one of the standard um, universal forces? And they would probably say gravity because we drop things all the time. We are held down to the ground all the time. Therefore, gravity is very visceral. We can see it, feel it, uh, and that sort of thing, okay? Now, we certainly know about electrostatic or electromagnetic um, sort of thing, but it turns out that electromagnetism, the general force kind of particle for particle, is a bazillion times greater than gravity, bazillion times greater. Uh, and an example of that would be, um, now, if we think back to our chemistry or just any of our general, our general science, um, we know that matter is made up of atoms. We know that atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, and the electrons are on the outside. And that a vast majority, 99.999% of a atom is empty space. So if it's empty space, then I should be able to put my hand, which is 99.99% of uh, empty space, through this whiteboard, which is 99.9% .9 um, empty space. I should be able to just push it right through, okay? But obviously that doesn't happen. And I wanna give you a second while I close the blinds to uh, think about why that is. Um, and the, the answer to that is electrostatic repulsion, electrostatic repulsion. So we all know that opposites attract, which means oppositely charged particles, protons and electrons will be attracted to each other. But similar charges, electrons and electrons, or protons and protons are going to repel one another. So when I try to stick my hand into the uh, whiteboard, the electrons, which are on the outside of the atoms of my fingers, of my skin, are going to then interact with the um, outer electrons of the whiteboard, and we're going to get those electrons closer and closer. And the repulsion, the repulsion is going to go higher and higher and higher. Okay. Now, the reason we normally think of gravity being the obvious fundamental force is because gravity um, is attractive only, is attractive only. And we certainly are aware of electromagnetism. Um, but the fact that the particle for particle um, interaction is a bazillion times greater uh, means that we should feel the electromagnetism a lot more. And we don't because uh, in electromagnetism, we have both repulsion and attraction, uh, and essentially they balance each other out. So um, that's why I can stand here uh, and I'm pushing down on the floor and the floor is pushing up on me because of that repulsion between the electrons. Okay, now there's two fundamental forces that I want to mention here, although we're not really gonna talk about it. Uh, and that would be the, um, the strong and weak nuclear force. Now, if we think about um, the protons and neutrons within the nucleus, all right, well, the protons are positively charged and they're very, very close together. Okay, so um, due to electrostatic repulsion, right, there's, there's an enormous force that's going to push them apart, okay? And even with the neutrons acting as um, kind of a buffer uh, in there, um, there is a huge repulsive force, and that strong nuclear force, that strong nuclear force um, holds those together. And the reason we don't really feel this, and it's not um, part of our everyday life, is because that strong nuclear force only works over distances that are the size uh, within the nucleus of the uh, atom. So very, very small ranges. Now, we can get so many protons uh, within a nucleus 
that there's just no way, there's just kind of no, um, no way that we're going to really end up with a stable, with a stable nucleus. Uh, and the new weak, the weak nucleus, the weak nuclear force um, is the force that um, essentially is going to um, oversee uh, radioactivity. Okay, so uh, even we, we can have atoms that are um, very sort of small, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, whatever, that are going to have isotopes that are radioactive. Um, but it is the weak nuclear force, the weak nuclear force that um, is going to dictate um, how those, how and when those things are going to, are going to go uh, and, uh, and split. All right, so back to gravity, back to gravity here. Now, we have something called the inverse square law. And the inverse square law is a very important concept to learn in science in general. And gravity, gravity follows the inverse square law. Okay, now, if we were to think about the force of gravity on um, Earth, okay, for example, we'd ask my weight, uh, and what we know now, uh, my weight is going to equal to mg, which is mass times gravity, which is a force because gravity is uh, an acceleration. Now, if we went to the moon, we went to the moon, and if you'd ask you what your weight is on the moon, uh, it would be less. But your mass would be the same. So the acceleration due to gravity would be less. So we know that mass is going to have a great deal to do with how much force of gravity there is. And force is proportional. Force is proportional to the mass um, of let's say me and the earth or me and the moon. And if the mass of the moon is less than the mass of the earth, then I'm gonna have less force as far as mass is concerned. Now, um, the inverse square law really refers to the distance, the distance between these two masses. Uh, and even though it's the distance, we think of it as a radius because if we were to go anywhere around, there'd be the same distance uh, and that would give us uh, a radius. So the force of gravity is proportional to the size of the masses, and there has to be an interaction between two masses uh, divided by the radius squared. And so this little concept right here, uh, the force of gravity is proportional to one over R squared. That's really the inverse square law. It works with electrostatics. It works with electromagnetism. It works with the voice that you're hearing the voice that you're hearing. So if you're listening to me in your computer and then you go from your room for saying you go out to the kitchen, you probably would not be able to hear me because you walked a greater distance away. Think about if we were over in uh, room 506 or outside the science building and we were talking in a normal conversational level in clear sight of let's say the top of the grandstands over at the football field, um, people over there would not be able to hear us because the intensity, the energy of the sound would dissipate. So it would dissipate going um, horizontally and vertically. And when we think about this, we end up with a square. So as it spreads out, it's going to dissipate. The density is going to dissipate as the square, as the square of the distance. Okay. Um, Earthquake waves, um, light, um, those sorts of things are all going to behave in a in an inverse square sort of thing. So that's why I'm saying knowing the inverse square law, the basics of it, um, is important to understand from a uh, from a science point of view, and particularly in a physics point of view. All right. So how do we make how do we make a inverse relationship? How do we make an inverse relationship uh, equal to an equation? How do we replace that? with an equal sign? And the answer is we need a proportionality constant, okay? So all right, so when I say proportionality constant, people kind of freeze up and say, I don't know what a proportionality constant is. Uh, yet everyone here really does know what a proportionality constant is. Um, they just don't really realize what it is. Okay, so if we were to go some distance, right, walking or hiking or something like that, um, we would, we can measure our distance in miles, or we can measure, or we can measure our distance in kilometers. So if we walk more miles, then we're going to walk more kilometers. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that they're equal, okay? But if we were to 
apply a proportionality constant, a proportionality constant, what would we multiply miles by to get kilometers? Okay, and that would be the proportionality constant. So you might say, uh, if we multiply miles by the point, I think it's 0.61, okay, then we would get kilometers, okay? So uh, if you think about a, uh, if you walked five miles, okay, so we could say, five miles multiplied by 0.61, and that would give us uh, three miles, okay, or three kilometers, sorry. So uh, that 0.61 is a proportionality constant. Now we could also write a proportionality constant, which the proportionality constant is typically, is typically going to be abbreviated with a K, which really comes from the German, um, constant as opposed to the English constant with the C. And if we had, if we had um, went, went five kilometers and we wanted to know uh, how many miles uh, that was, um, then, um, so, sorry, um, we can multiply I want to make sure I did not mess this up. So if we multiply kilometers times 0.61, um, we would get three miles. Okay, so I actually messed up. You guys, I messed up the proportionality, um, proportionality for the other one. So let's go back and take a look at the other one. So um, kilometers times... Um, 0.61 would give us miles. If we were to say uh, one or say five miles times 1.6, we would have eight kilometers. Okay, so that makes more sense uh, because a mile is longer than a kilometer. So um, I had the proportionality constant wrong to begin with, but we can see that if we're going one direction, we could have one, for example, 1 1.6. And if we go the other direction, we want to flip it over and one divided by 1 1.6 is about 0.61. Okay, so that's the proportionality constant. How does that fit in? How does that fit in with the uh, force of gravity? Uh, and that is that the, um, the force of gravity is equal to G M1, M2 divided by R squared. Okay, and that this G here, the G is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. And this is the universal gravitational constant. Okay, now if we wanna look at the units, we want to end up with this to have a force. So the units would be Newtons. We want to get rid of kilograms. So we would divide by kilograms times kilograms, which is kilograms squared. Radius in our standard units would be in meters. And therefore, we would want that meters squared on top. So the units for the, universe, the universal gravitational constant is going to be um, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 on uh, Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Now to show you, to show you that same formula from a, uh, an electrostatic point of view, uh, is we, we, we look at Coulomb's law. Okay. So that the, the force of electrical attraction or repulsion is going to equal to K Q1 Q2 over r squared okay now the q is just the charge and you might be um you might be aware from chemistry that the charges was either plus one or minus one but in fact uh one electron and one proton have a charge of one point um one point eight times ten to the negative 19th coulombs okay so a very small thing but if we take a look at this K here for electrostatic, 
uh, sometimes called as Coulomb's, uh, Coulomb's constant. That is nine times 10 to the ninth, nine times 10 to the ninth. And that would be uh, Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Okay, so we can see, we can see it's the same format. So when we see this force and this force, and we've got a constant times, in this case, mass, and in this case, charge divided by the radius squared, that is essentially the inverse square law. Now, if we look, if we were to take this divided by that, this divided by that, so we've got a difference of on magnitude about one times 10 to the 20th. So particle for particle, um, the um, proportionality is going to give us that electrostatic is about a hundred million, million, million um, times stronger than that of gravity. Okay, so we can see that it's a huge difference. But again, the reason we don't see it is because with electrostatics, we've got uh, a balance because it's not only repulsive, but it's also attractive. And with gravity, it's just attractive. All right. So now um, what we are going to do, and I'm gonna, you're going to see a question of the day that it's going to be like this. If we had two 100 kilogram people, okay, that were one meter apart, what would the force of attraction be? What would the physical force of attraction going to be? Now, I'm going to give you a question just like this, except it's going to be, uh, it's going to give you different, uh, different numbers. But if we plug this in, we can say 100 kilograms times 100 kilograms divided by one squared. And now we're going to have this G, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. So we're, we're going to have 100 squared is 10 to the fourth divided by one, which is 10 to the fourth times 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. 10 to the fourth, we're going to add. And we're going to have the force of gravity is going to be 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 plus four, which is going to be negative seven newtons. Okay, so we can see that when we have the attraction between two people, it's, it's super small, right? Now, if we were to talk about the weight, if we're talking about the weight of someone um, due to earth, right? Then we're going to put in the mass of the earth, which is going to be about uh, six uh, times 10 to the 24th. Six times 10 to the 24th kilograms is the mass of the earth, which we will talk about later. Uh, and that is going to give us uh, a force of gravity that's going to be about 900, uh, 980 newtons, 980 newtons. So that we can see is a bazillion times um, greater than 6.67 uh, times 10 to the negative seventh. Okay. Now, well, what if we have other, uh, more than one, more than one object? Okay. So, um, you guys, this may end up being a question of the day. Actually, we want to talk about one more thing. Okay. Now, because of this inverse square law, um, we're going to, we're going to have things that we can calculate uh, rather quickly as far as the forces go. You guys, I don't know if you know this, but this is my favorite spray bottle, right? If I have my favorite spray bottle and I am a distance of one, one away, okay, then we're going to call that an attraction of one, right? But if now I come twice as close, right? So I've cut the distance in half. What does my attraction, what is my attraction for the, for the bottle be? And it's going to be one over one half squared, which would end up being four times greater, okay? Now, if we put this over here, and now I end up essentially having twice the distance, or let's just think of it as three times the distance apart. Now it would be one over three squared. I would have an attraction to that water bottle of nine times less nine times less because it's one over three squared, which is one ninth. Okay. So in today's question of the day, I'm going to ask you a question like that. And I'm also going to give you some changes of distances. 
and ask you to calculate or figure out what those new forces are. Now, once you have this value, let's say 6.67 times 10 to the negative seventh, you don't have to redo that calculation. You're just either going to divide it by one half squared or multiply it by, um, you know, uh, one third, you know, squared. Just you're going to be able to adjust, which is going to be a factor <coughs> uh, that's the square of those distances. Okay. All right. So what if we have three, what if we have three masses? Okay, we're going to kind of uh, shift this a little bit. And so let's say we have a 10 kilogram object and then two meters away, we're gonna have another 10 kilogram object. And over here, we're gonna have a 10 kilogram object and now two meters and two meters, we're going to have just this spot. Now there's no mass there, but I want to know, is, is there a force? Is there a force of gravity right there? And if there is no mass, there's not a force of gravity there, but there is an acceleration. There's an acceleration due to gravity that we can, um, that we can set up here. And um, remember that the force of gravity from what we were used to was equal to mg, where g was the acceleration. And the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth is 9.8, right? Uh, and this is the force of gravity. But it's also now equal to big G, m1, m2 over r squared. Well, if this is the, for example, the mass of the Earth, and this is the mass we're trying to figure out, then this mass and this mass are going to cancel out. So we're going to get G is equal to big G times M divided by R squared. So this is going to give us the acceleration due to gravity at any point relative to uh, other factors. Now, so if this was if this was the mass of the Earth and this was the radius of the Earth, then the value that we would get would be 9.8. But if we do this now with 10 kilograms being two meters apart, then um, it's not going to be 9.8. It's going to be something pretty small. So what essentially what we're going to do is we're going to um, make this calculation three different times. We're going to make this calculation three different times, and we're going to add those values together. Okay. So now if we're going to plug this in, we're just going to take this mass of 10 kilograms um, and we're going, we're going to factor out this G. We're going to use this G at the end. And now we're going to divide it by two squared. Okay. So 10 divided by four is going to be 2.5. And again, we're going to have that G in there. And that would be this attraction right there. Well, this attraction right there would be the same thing. So we're going to have 10 divided by 2 squared, and that's equal to 2.5. But now we have this distance right there, and this would be 2 square root of 2, okay? And now we're going to say 10 divided by uh, 2 square root of 2 squared, which is going to be 10 eighths, which is going to be 1.25. So it seems like if we add up all the forces, we're going to end up with 6.25, 6.25, okay? Seems really simple, but that is not, that is not the answer, okay? It is not the answer because the acceleration and the force, remember, even though we don't write those, those are vectors, those are vectors. Okay, so now let's go to here, and we're going to figure this out. So we're going to have 2.5 here, we're going to have 1.25 here, and we're going to have 2.5 here. Now, it may or may be it may or may not be obvious. It may or may not be obvious, but when we add these three vectors together, it's going to go towards the center. It's going to go towards the center. And to show you that, I'm going to think of my x and y. I'm thinking my x and y um, axes is going to be along this diagonal. And now. I know since this is a square that we're going to have a vector like this and a vector like that. 
because our 2.5 is our hypotenuse. So if we want to know this value, we're going to say 2.5 times the sine of 45 degrees. 2.5 times the sine of 45 degrees is 1.77. 1.77. And we're going to do the same up here, and we're going to get uh, 2.5 times the sine of um, 45 degrees is going to be 1.77. Now, we can see here that this vector is pointing perpendicular in this upward direction, and this is 1.77. In the opposite direction, okay, perpendicular, but kind of in the downward direction, these two things are going to cancel each other out. Okay, so now we're going to left with these three vectors here. Well, this is 2.5 cosine 45, which is still going to be 1.77, 1.25, and 1.77. Okay, so essentially now when we come over to here, we're going to not have 2.5. We're going to have 1.77, 1.77, uh, and that's going to be 3.5 plus 1 and a quarter. Uh, which is going to be essentially 4.75, uh, 4.75. And now what we can do is multiply by our G, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. Okay. And now we're going to have our actual value. So uh, 4, 4.75 uh, times 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. And we would end up with uh, three point. Uh, so we would end up with three point um, two times ten to the negative tenth newtons. But that would be going towards the center. That would be going towards the center of the um, of the square. So that's when we have that's when we have more than um, more than one um, mass. So we essentially have to do um, the individual masses um, or in pairs. So um, if we had if we had let's say a one if we had a one kilogram object if we had a one kilogram object there, then we could just multiply it and go back to our force of gravity, and then this right here would be. Before we, it was an acceleration that would be meters per second, meters per second squared. And then if we added that mass of one kilogram, it would end up being um, this, this in, um, in, in newtons. Hold on a second. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so now... You guys, if you might be thinking here, if we were to plug in, like I said, um, if we're looking for G, we could put in big G, the mass of the Earth, and divided by the radius or the distance between the Earth and the moon squared, okay? Then we would end up with 9.8, okay? But you guys, how do we know? How do we know what the mass, how do we know what the mass of the Earth is? And we're going to go through that calculation. Um, but how do we know what the distance between the um, the Earth and the Moon is? Um, and without doing really um, the math to calculate the distance between the Earth and the Moon, geometrically, geometrically, um, that can be figured out. One way to do that, one way to do that, is through the parallax method. And I'll just do a quick little uh, drawing of this. So if we have the Earth here, and then we have the, we have the Moon. OK, uh, and then we've got some distant star out here. OK, we can end up um, measuring essentially this angle change, that angle change right there um, by measuring what that angle is with respect to a distant star when we are on one side of the Earth and um, when we have are on the other side of the Earth. Right. So if we know this angle, this right distance right here, is going to be the diameter that's going to be the diameter of the earth and so um this is going to become the radius of the earth and this is going to become half the angle and we can do a little pythagorean theorem uh, and we can calculate what the distance here is and it turns out that the distance between the earth and the moon which would be center to center is 384 
uh, million meters, 3.84 times 10 to um, the sixth meters or 300 or three point, sorry, 3.84 times 10 to the eighth meters. Okay. And I'll put that on the board here in a second. So how are we going to calculate? How are we going to calculate the mass of the earth? And so if we think, you guys, if we think about the moon, if we think about the moon going around the earth, okay, it would be a mass going around in a circle. So in the same way that we talked about an object moving uh, in a circle, okay, and in this case with this rubber stopper, um, it's the tension, it's the tension between the rope uh, and um, between my fingers and the mass that's going to keep it going. If you're going um, to turn on a flat surface in your car to make a turn, what is causing you to go towards the center? And that would be um, the friction between your tires and the road. And so you may remember that what that is, is going to be a centripetal force, centripetal force. So in this case, the centripetal force is going to be mv squared over r, okay? Well, if we have the moon, if we have the moon going around the earth, it is going to be moving in a pretty, pretty darn close to a, uh, a circular um, path. It's going to be slightly elliptical. We'll talk about uh, ellipses when we talk about uh, Kepler's laws, um, which is going to probably be our next lecture. Um, and so this centripetal force is caused by the force of gravity, which is big G. Uh, the mass of the Earth times the mass of the moon divided by the radius or that Earth distance squared. And if we just think about this, just to give us a perspective here. Okay, so if this is the Earth and now we're going to have this moon and so this distance right here, as we just talked about, is 384 times 10 to the sixth to the, um, so if we go 3.84 times 10 to the eighth, uh, and that is going to be in meters. Now, how do you know that? Now, you could look this up on the internet, but in your textbook, you guys, in your textbook, there, if you uh, go to the, this first page right here, it's going to give you a lot of different um, uh, information of constants. So if you go to the back side of this first page uh, on this upper part here, it's going to have you give you all this information about um, planets in the solar system, including um, including the Earth and the moon and the sun. And this is going to give us some distances. And if I look here, the average Earth moon um, distance is going to be uh, 3.84 times 10 to the eighth. Um, 3.84 times 10 to the eighth meters. 3.84 times 10 to the eighth meters. Okay, so that's going to be that distance. And again, we can figure that out. we can figure that out geometrically. Now, what what is the what is going to be the mass of the Earth? Okay, so now we're going to set this equal to mv squared over r. But since the moon is the one that's going around in the circle, this would be the mass of the moon. Okay, and so the mass of the moon and the mass of the moon is going to cancel each other out. Uh, this radius can uh, cancel out with that radius. Okay, uh, so we're getting there. So all we need to know is how fast, how fast is the moon moving tangentially in its orbit? Or what is the speed of the orbit? Well, I don't know what that is, but I do know that velocity and it's really speed here uh, and it's average speed because it's going to be a, a constant speed. Now, I'm saying speed because over time, okay, it's not velocity because the displacement after one cycle uh, would be zero. But in an instant, if this was moving, let's say in that direction, at an instant, we would have a velocity and it would be in the tangential direction. But anything more than an instant, it becomes speed. Regardless, we can still figure this out. Okay. Now we want distance divided by time or displacement divided by time. 
And in this case, it's going to be distance. And we're going to go 2 pi r, okay, which is one circumference. And we're going to do that in one period, right? Remember from um, the past couple chapters here, that period is the time for one complete cycle or one complete revolution. Okay, so now we know what V is. So now we can know that V squared is going to be <coughs> 4 pi squared R squared over T squared. Okay, and we're going to take this and we're going to plug it in here. Okay, and we can now say that um, the mass... Uh, or can we say G mass of the earth uh, is equal to V squared um, over R, okay? And now we're gonna plug in this V squared here, which is going to be four pi squared R squared over T squared. And now we're gonna move the this R up here and this G down here. And now we're gonna get the mass of the earth is equal to four pi squared r cubed divided by g by gt squared okay so now this is going to give us the formula now we could calculate the mass of um mars by knowing what the <coughs> radius between the um let's say phoebos which is one of the uh, moons of mars and knowing what that period and that distance would be, um, we could figure out the uh, the mass of Mars. Okay, so, but let's plug it in for the Earth and see what we get. Okay, so this is going to be four pi squared. Now the radius, as we said, was 3.84 times 10 to the eighth, and that gets cubed. That's gonna become a very big number. And now we're going to have 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. And that is going to be a, um, a make that number even bigger. But um, you guys, I'm not sure if you know what the period of the moon is. But the period of the moon is 27.3 days. 27.3 days. Um, and even though we have 27.3 days, we want that in seconds because our G is um, has a unit of newtons and within newtons, we're going to have seconds, right? So we're going to take 27.3 times 24 hours in a day times 60 minutes in an hour times 60 seconds in a minute. And we're going to get uh, 2.36 times 10 to the sixth. So... 2.36 times 10 to the sixth, uh, and that gets squared, okay? 2.36 times 10 to the sixth squared times 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. That's in the uh, denominator, multiplied by 3.84 times 10 to the eighth. Uh, times um, times pi squared um, uh, times 4. And that is going to give us 6.02 times 10 to the 24th. 6, 6 6.02 times 10 to the 24th. Now, you guys, I told you earlier that the mass of the Earth was about 6.02 times 10 to the 24th. If you look in, if you look in these papers right here, which are called the reference papers, uh, we're going to have the mass of the Earth is to be 5.98. Okay. So whenever you're looking at this, if you want to be more precise, you can use 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Uh, and that is the mass of the Earth, and that is um, based on the moon moving in a centripetal fashion. So if we were more precise with our numbers there, uh, then we would get that more precise value going from 6.02 to 5.98. All right. Now, until uh, next time, we will, um, we will see you.